<laughs> We're very thankful for all the people that come here together and uh, celebrate by serving, by serving the Lord. So I want to start out with a story. Once upon a time, there was a mother pig, and food was scarce. And so when it was the right time, she decided to send her three little pigs out so they could make their own way in the world. The first little pig was a little bit lazy, and he didn't like to work very much, and so he went out to build his house, and when he did, he built it out of straw. The second little pig was also a little on the lazy side, and so he went out, didn't really want to work that much, but he wasn't quite as lazy as the first pig, and so he built his house out of sticks. And those two celebrated and had a great time. They danced, and they sang, and they enjoyed every day together. And then there was this third pig who decided to go to architectural school and went and got his general contractor's license and bought some bricks, learned how to lay those bricks, you know, built his house. He was not lazy. He worked hard, and he worked all day long to build this beautiful, sturdy brick home, even with a chimney and a fireplace. And the next day, a wolf was walking by, saw the little house made out of straw, smelled the pig inside, and said, little pig, little pig, let me in. And the pig saw the wolf through the keyhole and said, no, 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 not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. The wolf said, well, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. And that's what he did. Now, the real story, he ate the pig, but we have a little nicer version. The pig ran off and we'll see him later. So the wolf eventually came to the second home and he could smell the pig inside. And so he says, little pig, little pig, let me in. The little pig said, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin, well then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down, and that's what he did. And he blew down the house of sticks. And then he came to the third house, and he said, little pig, little pig, let me in. Now this house is the house that was made of brick. Little pig, little pig, let me in, and they said, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin, and he huffed and he puffed and he huffed and he puffed, and he could not blow the house down, and so he got up on the roof and went down through the chimney and fell into a pot of boiling water. They put the lid on, and the pigs ate him for dinner. That's actually how that story goes, and here's the moral of the story. Bacon always wins especially when there's three pieces, but it will eventually kill you. That's how that goes. You know, the story has been around forever, and when you hear a story like that, I don't know about you, but it always makes me wonder, like, what was going on in that dude's mind when he came up with this story? Maybe he ate too late, and he had a little BLT for dinner, and that went through his mind all night. I don't know. Maybe he was trying to tell a story to his kids to say, if you're lazy, wolves will come and eat you. That's always a great teaching methodology. Or it is a reminder that it matters how we build our house. It matters what we build our house out of, and that's not just a physical house, but our lives. It matters how we build our very lives. And maybe he was actually thinking about 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Verses 12 through 13, which says this, Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw, but on judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. You know, it's hard to say that the writer of that fairy tale had that in mind, but it does bring up an interesting question for us, and I think it forces us to ask the question, what kind of house have you built? What kind of house have you built? What kind of house have I built? What kind of house have we built? A spiritual house. What kind of house is it? How was it made? What are you made of? The truth is, what you build a house out of does matter. And again, it matters with the home that you live in, but it also matters in our spiritual house because wolves do come, don't they? Storms do rage. Fires do consume and threaten to destroy the spiritual life that you have built. Personally, the spiritual life that we have here as a church. And so over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at what Paul has to say about building that spiritual house. And we've been talking about building strong spiritual foundations. And most of what we've talked about has been in a personal way. Like how do we individually make sure that our foundation is firmly set? in our lives. But of course, Paul goes on to talk about how it's not just an individual thing, it is a church thing, and that we've been talking about how we have interlocking foundations, that we were never called to go build the spiritual life in little sections over here and there, and we're separated from one another. In fact, the picture of the church is that we are interlinked together with the same foundation, 
And that we're building on that foundation together, but that foundation has got to be firm and strong, and that is Jesus. But when we build on that, we need to have the very best building materials to build the spiritual house. And so the Bible tells us something about that, and we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. If you have your Bible, I would love for you to turn there with me. We're going to spend just a few minutes talking about what Paul has to say to the Corinthian church, and some of it I'm giving it to you simply as context, but it's hard. What Paul says to them is hard. He is correcting them and challenging them and then teaching them. But listen to how this begins. This is Paul saying, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. In other words, Paul's saying, I'm not able to talk to you like spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. Now, this is a hard saying, don't you think? I mean, Paul is writing a letter to this church, and he's saying, you're not even like spiritual people. You're just like everybody else, and you're immature in Christ. You're infants. I fed you milk because that's what babies drink. I fed you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it, and even now you are still not ready You see, Paul spent like a year and a half with them, teaching them, and he's been gone for a period of time, maybe another year and a half or so, and now he's hearing the reports of where they are, and they haven't grown up. In the time that he was with them, in the time that he was away, he now sees and he's letting them know that you are still not maturing. You're still infants in Christ, and I can't even speak to you as strong spiritual people because you don't know what I'm talking about. You're still on the milk, and you still don't understand. Verse 3, for you still, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? In other words, you're not behaving like the spiritual kind of person that you should be. And we see stuff like this in various places. Like when you look at Philippians uh, chapter 1, or chapter 2, excuse me, verses 3 through 5. Listen to what it says. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. In other words, have the same mind. Come together. Be thinking the same thing. The problem with the church in Corinth is they are divided. They're not in unity. They don't understand the same things, and what's happening is there's jealousy among them, there's strife among them, there's division among them. They're acting just like everyone else. They're not acting like the church that they were supposed to be. Verse 4, for when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? You're acting like unbelievers. See, what's happening is there are people within the church going, well, I listen to what Paul said. He is my foundation. And others are saying, well, no, Apollos is the one that I am listening to. He's the one that I'm following. He's my foundation. And surely there were others there that were saying, Paul's not the foundation. Apollos isn't. Jesus is. And there's all this division because everyone is thinking different things. They're focused on different things. And so he continues, verse 5, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants. You see, part of what Paul's saying to them is, why are you getting stuck in these divisions about who you're following? We are nothing more than servants. This would be like the mansion and a huge estate falling apart because the people that own the estate couldn't decide what servants they wanted to follow. It doesn't make sense. And Paul is saying, we're just servants through whom you believed, yes. And so, in other words, he's not saying that that God doesn't use people. God absolutely uses people to plant seeds and direct people's faith. There's no question about that. Paul's not saying that that's not still true. But we're just servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Yeah, Paul planted the church. There were others that came alongside to build on that foundation that were watering what was happening there. But at the end of the day, God is responsible for salvation, not me, not Apollos. And this is what's happening here. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He says it a second time. 
He who plants and he who waters are one. We are unified, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. Yes, we have different jobs, but we are unified. We're in this together. And by the way, Paul's not saying you shouldn't honor your leaders. He, that's not part of this. And, and I say this, but it sells, sounds a little self-grandizing, but there are other leaders here than me. Part of what is said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work be at peace among yourselves you see all of that fits together that this idea that why are you getting stuck in all these things there should be unity there should be peace among you because this is where we really grow and part of the reason they're not growing is because of this division that they're acting like fleshy humans they're not acting like the spiritually redeemed people that they've been called to be and so he goes on to say I'll start back in verse 8 again. He who plants and he who waters are one. Each will receive his wages according to his labor. In other words, there will be rewards for those that do the work that they're called to. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. And so Paul spends all this time talking about the foundation and what it really is and making it clear he is not the foundation, making it clear that Apollos is not the foundation, no other earthly leader is the foundation, only Jesus. But then he goes a little more personal and he shifts the metaphor from being just God's field to being God's building. You are God's building. And you see in other places that when you're a believer and the Holy Spirit lives within you, that we, in that sense, become the temple of the Holy Spirit. But we are God's building. And then he talks about how we are to build our lives then. If we're God's building, we are to build our lives on the spiritual foundation as God's building. And this is what he begins talking about then. Look at verses 10 and 11. It says, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, we talked about this last week, I laid a foundation, someone else is building on it. This is true, we're all building on this interlocking foundation. And then he says, let each one take care of how he builds on it. Take care of how you build on the foundation, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so, let's take a little inventory of the construction site. I mean, this is what verse 10 says, take care of how you build on it. Pay attention to how you build your life on this foundation. And so it begs the question again, since you've become a Christian, how has the construction gone? Since you called on the name of Jesus to save you, since you were washed clean in the waters of baptism, how's the building project been going the building of your spiritual life, how's it been? What kind of foundation is there? Is it steady? Is it sure? Or is it actually sinking sand? Have you been purposeful to build the spiritual house? Or maybe quick to just knock it out and get some stuff done haphazardly or sporadically building on the spiritual house? Like, oh yeah, I probably should do a little bit of that today, but coming and going, is it a hovel or is it a mansion that you're building this life on Christ, storm-proof, or could it collapse at any moment? Your life, the spiritual life, what are the building materials, and will they stand up to the wolves when they come? Will the spiritual house that you're building stand up to the wolves when they threaten to destroy you? How about us? Have we built the spiritual house, the church, to stand up to the wolves when they come and threaten to destroy us? You know, every builder has materials that they like to work with. Every builder has specific things that they want to deal with and work with and build with. Some materials may be costly. Some of the materials are not, and that's okay. Some materials may be of the finest quality, and some of them may not be. All builder's grade that doesn't last long. Some materials are specifically designed for different kinds of environments because it's needed Certain building materials need to be there for the environment, and when that's ignored, devastating consequences can happen. Some materials are designed to withstand wind and water and even fire and hurricanes and tornadoes, and every builder makes choices about what kind of soil they want to work in, how big and deep the foundation will be, and the entire structure. Every builder makes decisions, and the same goes 
for you and me. The same goes for us, every Christian. Every Christian is a builder. You are a builder, and so am I. Now, not everyone in here is a Christian, and if you're not, you're in the right place, and it's time to lay that foundation. But every Christian is a builder, and as long as we are alive, we are building. We are building on Christ. We're building our lives on Christ. It is a lifelong adventure. This is part of why Jesus says, go and make disciples, that's apprentices, spiritual apprentices, baptize them, and then teach them to obey everything that I've commanded. That is a lifelong journey. There's not some point that we get to and we go, I've got it all figured out. Boom, check the last box, like we finished some degree or something. It's a lifelong journey for all of us, for every single one. And we too must be aware of the soil. That, that parable that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 13, you're probably familiar with that parable, I would imagine, that idea that a sower goes out to sow, and they sow seed everywhere they go, but it falls on four different kinds of soil. Some of it is rocky, hard, and the seed cannot get in, and it will never go anywhere. The birds will actually come and eat it and steal it away. Some of the soil has lots of thorns in it, and it will choke out the plant. Some, the soil is full of rocks, and so the the roots can never get deep, and when the sun comes out, it scorches it, and some of the soil is good and ready. And the question always is, how's our soil? If there's rocks in there, shouldn't we be digging those things out or dealing with those weeds so that there's something that can grow deep inside of us? And so the soil absolutely matters. The soil matters to us, at least it needs to. But not just the soil. We too must choose a foundation again. The foundation of our spiritual lives cannot be a guy. The foundation of your spiritual lives cannot be me. It can't be. The spiritual foundation of your lives cannot be some other pastor or minister. It just can't be. This is what Paul is saying to the church in Corinth. It cannot be based on a guy. It's got to be based on Jesus. And when we start building, God wants us to build with only the best materials. Only the best, because only the best materials will be most effective, only the best materials will be long-lasting, will be safest, will be worthy of the chief designer who designed us to be his masterpieces. You were designed to be a masterpiece. And that's beautiful. But this, of course, has to do with our spiritual lives and even the life, again, of the church that's continuing to be built, this place we called Renew, and it has nothing to do with the physical structure. This isn't something that we're trying to make a case for that we need marble floors, although I will tell you that is where some of these people will go. Some pastors will think this is what that's talking about, but that's not at all what we're talking about. And so Paul, as the master builder, lays out for us some building materials we can choose. Listen to this, starting at verse 12 then. Verse 12, it says, Now, if anyone builds on the foundation... With gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. That means each one's work will become obvious, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. Now, this isn't talking about salvation, by the way. They're already saved, and this passage goes on to talk about it, but it's about rewards for those who are faithful. And Paul talks about it in various places. He'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. These are challenging words. These are challenging things. But Paul talks about there's two categories of building materials. The first one is the gold, silver, and precious stones. These are all positive things. These are all good things that Paul says we are building on this foundation with, and these clearly represent high-quality building materials. But in reality, it's not trying to make a case that gold's higher than silver or higher than something else. It's about something beautiful and valuable and long-lasting, something that would not be easy to burn up and fire. This is how we build our spiritual houses. But then there's a second category of wood, hay, and straw, like the little piggies who build straw houses and stick houses. These clearly represent inferior building products. 
these materials don't represent talents or abilities or even spiritual gifts. What Paul is talking about, these materials represent a couple things. One thing it represents is the teaching from this platform. If you look at it in the context of what's happening, Paul is no doubt talking to leaders and that the things that are spoken, the things that are taught to the church need to be high value. They need to be of gold and silver and precious stones, not stuff that burns up. But it's not just that. He's also talking about these materials that represent how a builder, a Christian, builds his or her life after salvation. After we become saved, what do we do about it? And there are all kinds of ways that we build. One of the ways that we build, and one of the ways that we build that will tell the difference between whether we're building with gold, silver, and precious stones, or if it's just wood, hay, and straw, is with our motives. You can tell how are we building our house based on our motives. So here's what I mean. So June is a big serve month. On those five Sunday months, we have a big serve, but in June, we're having it as an extended thing rather than us all go out somewhere and asking you to bring something in and bringing in food so that we can feed hungry people. And so if you were to go shopping and bring some food in, but in your heart, you're saying to yourself, you know, I hate doing this. And I wish the church would quit asking us to bring food and bring all this stuff. These people that come and get it, they probably don't really need it at all anyway but I'm going to do it. Well, guess what? Your motives in that case would be wood, hay, and straw. But if you were to do this as a genuine heart for the needy, out of a love and gratitude for what God's given you, you're building with gold, silver, and precious stones. How about another motive coming up in a place like this? If you're coming up here to sing and to play and to preach, but you're only concerned with what people think about you, you're building with hay and sticks and straw. But if you come to a place like this and you're doing it to glorify God as my audience of one, you're building with gold and silver and precious stones. Motives matter when we're building the spiritual house. How about giving out of duty or pressure? You know, if you think to yourself, I'm going to give this, but I really don't want to. I'm going to give this financial thing to the church because I'm supposed to, but I feel like they're going to pick on me about it or whatever, which of course we don't do. But I'm going to give it, but I'm mad about it. That is building with wood and straw and hay. But giving consistently and generously out of a love for God to spread the gospel, to serve others, to help people find salvation in the name of Jesus, that's gold, silver, and precious stones. Our motives matter, how we're building this spiritual house. And by the way, that ties in with things like where we invest our resources as well. Think about where we spend our money. If our whole lives are focused on spending our money on stuff that will eventually burn up, then we're focused on wood, hay, and straw. But if we're investing our time, talents, and yes, treasures in things that have eternal significance, they don't burn up. So we build our house with motives, but we also build our house with conduct. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, let me just tell you, I think this is maybe an unfortunate rendering of what this text says. That word judgment in Greek is bima, B-E-M-A. It's a simple word. But bima, for the people that were hearing this for the first time, here's what they would have understood. Now, we, we explain it in English from the Greek as a judgment seat of Christ. And when you hear judgment seat of Christ, you think only negative things, I would imagine. That's usually what we think of. But the Bema, back in those days with the Isthmian Games and Olympic Games and things, the Bema would have been a raised platform with stairs that come up to it where you receive your reward from winning at a game. This is how they would have understood it. That there's a Bema there that you come to accept your reward. And this is what Paul's talking about. For we must all appear before the Bema. But we're translating it as the judgment seat of Christ. So that each one may receive... What is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Whether our conduct is good or evil. That's the bema, where we come to receive our rewards. Because ultimately, our conduct can be evil. The Greek word there that Paul uses is phallos, which means useless. Our work can be worthless. What is that? Wood, hay, straw. But our work can also 
be good, agathos, good in quality, long-lasting, gold, silver, precious stones. And so when our actions, our conduct are tested by fire, some will last and some won't. And for those whose conduct is gold, silver, precious stones, God will reward that person. There will be rewards. And there's a third thing that we can understand. It's how we build the spiritual home. We build with our service or with our good works. We build with the things that we do. Of course, we're not saved by good works, but we were created in Christ Jesus for them. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works, and we're to walk in them and live in them. This is what Ephesians 2.10 says. You were created for it. Not just something we do, but a part of who we are. You were created for these good works. How we live out our lives is indicative of what has happened inside of us as God has transformed us and cleaned us, sanctified us, cleaned us from the inside out. These things are indicative of how well we've allowed him to do it. Back to Paul, these different building materials are not about you and I looking at people and going, you know, that guy came to serve, but it was kind of a straw and hay serve. Wasn't really into it. Or that lady, man, she was serving in a gold way today. You see, none of those things, this analogy, this metaphor, none of it is designed for us to decide how someone is building their spiritual house. Truly, only God can determine which works are of high quality and which ones aren't because only God knows the heart, right? The actions are important, but the motives behind it are even more so. The point is that our purpose in life should always be to serve the Lord with the very best that he has given us. To serve the Lord with our very best. This is genuine faith. This is genuine life. This is genuine action. And everything we do, we're called to do it as if we're doing it for him. If you serve here, you're not doing it to please me. If you serve even at work, you're not doing it to please a boss. Everything we do is for him. This is one of the differences of the Christian life. This is one of the differences of a mature believer that the Corinth people were not. You look at places like Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. There should be a theme here that we see. As we build the spiritual house, and since Christ is the foundation, he's at the center of our work. He must be. If Christ is not the center of our work, he may not be the foundation. But Christ has got to be at the center of our work, and not just for religious busy work. We don't want to just go out and be busy for the Lord and, you know, have that mindset like, oh, quick, look busy, Jesus is coming. Not that stuff. This isn't just church programs or projects that have very little impact. That stuff's hay and straw. I will say, though, at the same time, in the metaphor that Paul's telling, I mean, wood, grass, and straw, they're not evil. They just aren't long-lasting. Does that make sense? They just don't stand up to the test and to the trials that come our way. And then there's a fourth thing that we build, a fourth way that we build, And that fourth thing is that we build as a church as well. You see, it's not just about your individual lives or my individual lives. It is us together. And remember, when we talk about the church, we're not talking about this building. This building is not the church. This building doesn't matter. This is a mission station. If it burned down tomorrow, the church is fine. We'd bring lawn chairs and we'd sit right here in this concrete. And guess what? The church would be fine. We're the church. We're the church. Interlocking foundations, coming together, and we build together in love, in unity, not division like what was going on in Corinth. But we build together in love. Ephesians 4, 15, 16 says, speaking the truth in love. We are to one another, speak the truth in love. To speak the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. See, I want to say that too. On this entire metaphor, Spencer Dunlap is not the head of this church. Jesus is. Always. 
We're growing up every way into him who is the head, into part of is working, excuse me, into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. See, this is a commissioning to the entire church to grow and to build the spiritual house together. And when we do it, when we're working properly, the whole body grows and it is built up in strength and we do it through love. And so the question is when you contemplate Renew or this church or even the Church of America, because it's not just this church, but the churches all around that proclaim Jesus. The question is, is what do we stand for? Who are we, really? Like, if we asked an 8-year-old and an 80-year-old, would they give the same answer? Who are we, and what do we stand for? Are we living it out? Are we a holy huddle, or are we an army of the living God? Those are different things. Do you agree? Are we practicing what we preach, or are we all talk? Are we investing every penny of resource and energy and time in ourselves? Or are we investing in a mission that reaches people with the good news of Jesus so that they're saved? Are we teaching and preaching truth that transforms lives? Or are we preaching and teaching fluff that only tickles the ears? Gold, silver, precious stones or wood, hay, straw. How we build matters. So what? Why is it so important? Well, what you build a church out of matters. What you build a church out of matters. And again, I don't mean this physical building. That's not what I'm talking about. That doesn't matter. But your mission and your vision, the decisions that define us, and if you don't know what those decisions are, just go on the other side of this wall and you'll see some of them. Things like we're a mission station, not a museum. We're an army, not an audience. Special forces, not spectators. These are the decisions that define us. Our mission is to discover God and develop relationships and deploy to the world. And our vision simply is to transform lives. What I'm doing now is not to transfer information from my brain to yours. It is for transformation. That it changes us inside because if it doesn't, it is a waste of time. What we build the church out of matters. How you continue to build a maturing church matters. This happens best in community. And we're going to talk about this more and more and more as we get closer to fall, about how do we grow in maturity together? How do we grow in maturity as a church to make sure that we never get stuck as infants in Christ, but instead we're growing and growing? How you do that matters. And how to grow and mature as disciples who make disciples it matters. And then biblically sound teachers matter. You know, one of the things that we're going to work on this year, and we've done this before in little spurts, but one of the things we're going to do is expand our teaching team here at Renew. Now, that doesn't mean it's a replacement for me. I'm not replacing me. But there are people here that God works through besides me. Everybody knows this, yes? And there are people here that have stories that need to be told through Scripture to be able to transform lives. And so we're going to continue to add to our teaching team to grow that. Again, not to replace me, but to give me space to be able to develop other leaders for the kingdom. Church planters for other places. This is part of what God has called me to, to be able to train them up how and how to do these things. And so that means we're going to formalize some roles within the church. Like, for instance, we have some volunteers that we're bringing in in formal ways. And we have a family, I'll tell you about it more, that are going to come in and they're going to help us with small groups. We have another one like Chris Hart, who's been a volunteer in amazing ways, and bring him on staff at least part-time to formally be able to do some things here that we need him to focus on, and even bringing new ministers on staff and continuing to grow that way with specific jobs and specific skills that God has answered our Luke 10 to prayer with, like Kurt Irvin and his wife Robin, where Kurt's going to focus on assimilation. When you walk in the front door, how do we continue to move people in so that they have a life-giving, long-lasting relationship with Christ? And also to teach leaders how to lead 
Because there's one thing about leaders. Leaders must lead. And we need to train them how to do it well. And it's not just about building the church with things that matter. It's also, again, about building our lives with things that matter. And there are rewards from God for those who are doing it on purpose, focusing on the things that are long-lasting, investing in the things that are long-lasting and not burning up. And so where do we go from here? Now what? What about all of this? Well, let me ask you, who's afraid of the big bad wolf? It's easy to be afraid. Do you agree? It's easy to get scared. Of course, the Bible tells us that. You look at places like 1 Peter 5, 8, the devil prowls around like a ravenous lion. Maybe for our metaphor, a wolf seeking someone to devour. Jesus sends us out like sheep in the midst of wolves. And we have to be wise. We have to be wise. Use wisdom from God. That's Matthew 10, 16. And we do have to be careful because false prophets will come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves, Matthew 7, 15. Everything gets tested with Scripture. Everything. Because Jesus is the center of the foundation. And so what must we do? We'll build on the foundation. Build on the foundation. Let's build on your foundation. Let's build together, and let's build the foundation of this church, a strong spiritual house with materials that will last, not ones that are carnal, fleshy, the things of this world that will eventually burn up or become someone else's when you die, that they just can't figure out what to do with it. To not build our lives on that, but to build our lives on things that matter. And so over the next week or so, I want to invite you to take some very practical steps. And here's where it begins. Do some building inspection. Take some time to pray and do some inspection of the spiritual house that has been built and ask yourself what's my spiritual house been made of if it's wood straw and hay fine start building one brick at a time let's fortify that thing so that when the wolves come you stand and you're strong get in that bible find a mentor ask someone around you would you hold me accountable would you help me to put one brick on top of the other, brick by brick? This is a marathon, not a sprint. If you're homeless, in other words, you never did anything to build on that foundation. Maybe you made a commitment to follow Christ at some point when you were a kid. Maybe you were baptized even. But you've done nothing to build the spiritual house. Well, let me just tell you, put on Christ for real this time. Maybe it is time for some of you to be baptized, that is to die to self, bury the old you and come back in this new life and begin to build this spiritual house with the finest materials that God has to offer and then learn to obey. If you're living in someone else's spiritual house, in other words, you really haven't done the work, you've just been tucked up underneath someone else's home, spiritual home that they've built, and it's time to grow up, move out, and start building your spiritual house. One brick at a time. And if your house has taken some storm damage, repair it. A lot of our homes have ha taken some storm damage along the way. Yeah? A lot of our ho homes have been knocked around a time or two by the trials of life. Rebuild it. Quit using it as an excuse. And if you've done something to destroy your own house, repent. Turn around. Go back God's way. Make it right and begin to walk worthy. And if your house is solid, then build another story. Literally and figuratively. Keep growing. And if your house is big and strong, show others how. We need you. We need strong spiritual leaders to come and show people how to build the house get in community, get in your Bible, get in your prayer closet, get serving, and get in front of Jesus every day, starting right now. Today, I invite you to do a little inspection through prayer, but 
I invite you to get in front of Jesus at communion. There's stations all around the room. It's open for anyone who calls on the name of Jesus to take that bread and take that cup that remind us of body broken and blood shed. Get in front of Jesus and ask him to continue to build that foundation for you that you will see him as the solid rock and foundation and that you are motivated to build the spiritual house that will withstand the pressure that comes our way, the wolves that come to threaten to destroy, and then worship like you've never worshiped before. When you worship, you're not worried about what other people think. If you are, that's wood, straw, and hay. You worship because you are worshiping one. You're not worshiping me, you're not worshiping Dixie, you're not worshiping the worship team, you're not worshiping a building, you're not worshiping the author of a song. You are worshiping a God who made you a wonderful masterpiece, fearfully and wonderfully made. Worship. This is part of how we build the spiritual house. And don't let it just be today. But to live a life of worship begins to build the house that will withstand. And this last thing, if you feel like you have failed and you've gone too far, we're going to talk about that next week and how to overcome failure because we all have. And so today, get in front of Jesus, build that spiritual house, begin the process one brick at a time, grab someone and say, help me, I need help, and let's build it together and build this together, what God has created us for. Let me pray and invite you to a time of communion and worship and reflection. Father, thank you for what you've done in this church in the last eight years. My deal with you in the beginning was that we would be amazed, never surprised. And you've done amazing things. So Father, now I pray that you will help us to grow in you more and more. Not just numerically, but I pray that we will reach thousands for you. Not to just say we have a bigger church, but because we want to see tens of thousands of people in heaven. And so I pray that you will help us to build our spiritual house together and individually so that we can disciple the next generation, so that we can show the next set of people what Jesus looks like, and that we can grow and build in you with things that will last and it will fight against the trials of this life where there are many. So strengthen us, encourage us, let our foundation be deep and strong, and let us build on that foundation. Jesus, it's in his name that we pray.